Okay, we're holding here in the Maimer of Purim, right? Lahavin Maimer Chazal. And we are up to Pedic, the end of Vav, page 125. 125, close to the bottom. Today's class is dedicated by Reb Noyam Kapach for the continued good health of Rivka Bas Yehudis. Amen. Thank you very much, Reb Noyam. Okay, I told you that next week I'm going to Eretz Yisrael, Be'ezer Hashem, so uh, there's going to be a class for the women on Tuesday morning, but then I'm flying, so next week and the week after there won't be any shiur. That's next week, Parsha Tzav, and the week after, Parsha Shmini. <laughs> okay, what was the Nakuda we learned yesterday? The Gedengst? The Gedengst noch? That what? Ain't a good day, yeah. I must. Oh, okay, I got you. Thank you, thank you. The point, the the main point was that the loy seidi la chayafa banashim that existed during the time of Esther turned into adalayada. The lack of das, which would fit, which would, which on one level would be something challenging, difficult, tragic, turns in to something that is greater beyond greatness. It turns into the Megillah, which doesn't have Hashem's name. And here again, it's the same paradox. It doesn't have a name. It's loy seidilach. I don't know you. I don't see you. Certainly, don't see the beauty. Hayafa banoshim. But it turns into touching the core that is beyond names. The name of Yaakov Yisrael Yeshurun, in the regular classic name of the Jewish people. It's also not in the Megillah, but it turns into Yehudi, Yehudi, which represents Haida'a, the submission, the, the surrender, the relationship with that which is beyond intellect. And therefore it's not something I grasp, but something I surrender to. I'm a vatal, my metzius, like Adelayada. And it's here that all the Jews are completely equal. Both in the decree, they're equal. It's not like, oh, Mordechai, you're really Jewish. You know, this Jew is a half a guy. So, no. <laughs> for, the, for the Haman, every Jew is Mordechai. No difference. And it's still today. You see it today by every Haman that exists. Every Jew is Mordechai. There's no difference. You could scream from today till tomorrow that you're not, but there's something that they feel in you. So usually <laughs> we see it as a terrible lie, but there's actually a terrible truth. I'm saying a terrible truth, because sometimes it's a tragic truth, but it's, it's a truth. It, and it needs to be celebrated instead of, instead of mourned. And that is that this holiness of Yehudi is a core state of being that doesn't differentiate. There's no differentiation. And that's why even Moshe is called Pesi. The Medrash says Moshe is called Pesi. Pesi Yamin Lechol Dover. Which means a fool believes everything. And uh, it seems so disrespectful that the Medrash would use these words for Moshe Rabbeinu. It seems like the Pasuk is actually you know, dismissive. You're a fool, you believe everything. I'm a Chachim, I don't believe anything. <laughs> they tell a very good story. It's a very Gishmak story I once heard from somebody. It's very relevant to uh, to this time, <coughs> especially for intellectuals, scientists, intellectuals. You're a Harvard graduate, so you'll appreciate the story. They say that uh, there was a uh, a summit, there was a conference, an international summit between all the fools. Already in the times of Shleimah Melech, what's the problem? 
Problem is, it used to be when I came into the fool said when we came into a room, nobody knew that we were foolish. Nobody knew, so you can hide, so you can get a good shidduch, you can get a good job, you can even become a, a prominent member of the community or the club, whatever it is. Nobody knew that we were fools. Came King Solomon, Shleim Malach, and he opened the lid. He disclosed it. He made a statement in Mishlei, Pesi Yamin Lechol Dover. Fools believe everything. That's it. The secrets are now out. There's no way of hiding our identity. The shame, the humiliation, the embarrassment, the disgrace is going to be eternal. So they sat for seven days and seven nights, all the fools in the world. said, what do we do about this? And then they decided, what do we do? There's only one Eitzah. The Eitzah is to do the opposite of what Shleim HaMalach said. So nobody will figure it out. And that's when the fools made a decision. We're never going to believe anything. <laughs> We're never, ever going to believe anything. So nobody will ever know that we are foolish. And this has been going on since the days of Shleim HaMalach. Verstehst? It's a very deep story, yeah? <laughs> and that's why Pesi Yaman L'chal Dovaz Sometimes the greatest wisdom is to be a Pesi. And that's what Adla Yada means. Right? There's an expression in Sifri Chkir in Jewish philosophy, in, Jewish philosophy in, Jewish, in the works of the philosoph- Jewish philosophers. Tachlis Hayidiya Shaloy Neidacha. The ultimate Yidiya, the ultimate knowledge is Adla Yada. Tachlis Hayidiya Shaloy Neidacha. Ah, the Rambam, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's Tachlis Hayidiyah. In other words, the, after I reach all the Yidiyah, Moshe Rabbeinu, who reached the Yidiyah, right? It says he reached the 49 gates of wisdom. The Gemara says in Rosh Hashanah, and on the last day of his life, he went up to Har Nevoi, and the Magad of Mezrich says, Nevoi is Nun Boy, the 50th gate. So Moshe, on Moshe it says, Pesi Yaman L'Chaldavah. That's the Indian of Yehudi, and that's the Nekud of Adaloyada. And this came precisely in the lowest situation, a situation of lahashmid Lairagul Abed. So he explains because in Avoida, emotionally, psychologically, there was the lahashmid Lairagul Abed, not in a not in a in a negative sense, not in a cursed way, but like we say in Davening at the end, Vinafshi Ka'afar La Kaltiya. This explains also Esther tells Mardukha, I'm gonna go into the king Ashaloi Kedas, not according to the law, not according to the structure. So usually that's like the tragic, that's one of the most tragic lines in the Megillah. It's very sad. That's where Esther was. Mentally, Rashi brings from the Gemara, V'chashar Avadati, Avadati means not just if I perish, I perish, but rather I perish spiritually. At kan ba'oynes, achshav b'ratzen. In other words, till that point, the only reason she went into Hashverish is because she was coerced. This is the first time she's doing it willingly. Remember, when you went into Achashverish, it wasn't to play dreidel. And it wasn't even to eat latkes or to eat hamantashen. And it wasn't to meditate together. It was a different experience. Achashverish wanted one thing. So as to going into Achashverish, I'm going in Biratzen. The first time she voluntarily submitted to him and that meant v'chashar vadati avadati, pashat halachically, once it's Biratzen, once you do it willingly, once she does it willingly, it's a whole different already halakha ramifications. So that was kashavadati avadati. There's also different interpretations, but it's very powerful words. Here we're learning that there's also something much deeper. The feeling of Esther, Esther captured the moment of kashavadati avadati. When you lose everything, you're open, you're open to everything. Or to put it this way, when you're reduced to nothing, you're open to everything. When you're reduced to nothing, yeah, that's Adelo Yada. When there's Loy Seidilach, I let go. I completely let go. I don't grip. I don't have anything. That's the Nukud of Lahash Mid Laragul Abed. Esther experienced in her core. And from this, what happened? She became the most powerful person. <laughs> this meek woman, this meek, uh, passive, uh, so what seemed like submissive woman, became uh, one of the most. Uh, one of the most effective strategists who not only had Haman and Achashverosh wrapped, <laughs> wrapped around her small finger and then started to run the whole Maisa, but Lafayel, she saved the entire Jewish world till today. 
Right. And it all started because Mardechai told her, as we once spoke, Mi Yodeya im leis kazei sigat lamalchos. In other words, this is something beyond das. Not Mi Yodeya, who knows? I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe not. This was too fateful a moment for Mardechai to say, I don't know, Mi Yodeya, who knows? Like, who knows uh, why you moved to Muncie? I don't know. Who knows why you ended up in this job? Who knows? Maybe, yeah, maybe not. You're asking Esther to go into a mission which is suicidal. Right? She said, Achaz dasa lahamas. You go in without permission, he kills you, the guy. So you're asking her to endanger her life, at least 50%, maybe 80%. It's a serious mission. Then, me, Eideya, who knows? Who knows? Maybe this is why you did it. So the Rebbe explains, me, Eideya was not a question of ambivalence. It wasn't a statement of ambivalence. It was a statement of Adalayada. Me, Eideya means there's moments in life that are beyond das. In other words, who was the first one to fulfill the mitzvah of Adalayada on Purim? Esther. It sheds so much profound light that where did Rav get this idea? You know, we look at it almost like, you know, let's give the Jews one day that they could just, you know, freak out and be a little crazy. It's, their religion is intense. <laughs> The poor Bachim are sitting in yeshiva all day. They can't smoke. They can't drink. They're not normal teenagers. Look what's happening with other teenagers. Just give them one day that they can be Goyim Gemurim and call themselves from Orthodox Bnei Taira. That's like how we understand Purim, more or less. This Maimus is Pugfarket. It's higher than Yom Kippur. It's... <laughs> Rava, suddenly Rava, Rava lived hundreds and hundreds of years after Purim. Purim happened before Bayez Shani. Rava lived in Bavel, the later generation of Amirayim, fourth generation, I think fourth generation of Amirayim. Rava lived in the fourth century, third century, fourth century, a few hundred years after Chorban Bayesheni. So Rava lived almost a millennium, almost eight, around, I would say around 800 years after Purim. So suddenly, 800 years after Purim, you decided, the Gemara says in Megillah of Zion, nobody ever heard of this. It's like 800 years after Pesach, somebody decided we have to eat matzah, we have to eat mother, we have to make a seder. It's like, <laughs> fine, it says in the Megillah to celebrate, we're going to celebrate. Rav says, what does it mean, Mechayev Rava was revealing the story of the Megillah. He wasn't creating a, oh, let's make now and now. Let's put him now. We got to be wild completely. He was touching the Nekudah of Purim. What's the Nekudah of Purim? Adalayada. Lo yisaydi lo chayafe banoshim. Becomes Adalayada. And that's why, if you look at the, the Nesham of it, that's what you'll see. Adalayada, you don't see Hashem's name. You don't know. There's no Gili of Hashem. Adalayada, there's no regular Gili of the Jewish name, Yaakov Yehuda. What comes out is Yehudi, which is Layada, Hayda. He tells Mardechai, Mi Yodeya, which is beyond Das. And the moment he tells her, Mi Yodeya, there's some missions in the world that are beyond Das, it touched Esther in that place. Esther became a Yehudi. Her lay Seydi Lach became Adel Layada. In other words, the fact that I don't know anything and life is so dangerous and this is a crazy story and this is completely insane, it became her core strength. What, be, what was full of doubt, right? Suffolk. Suffolk is Begamatria Malik. Mi Oideya is Suffolk. It's Begamat, that, that's the problem. Suffolk. So he, turned this, he took the Suffolk and he turned it into, Mardukhai turned it into her most powerful strength. Yeah, this is a very, very deep idea how, how the, 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 the breakdown of everything, the fact that I got nothing together, gave her something that was infinite. Yeah, you don't have anything. You actually don't have anything. I don't know nothing. Now your heart can be opened up. You can't prepare for this moment because if your ego prepares for this moment, it's not this moment. You're going to say, right now is going to be lahashmid lanagalabit when I nullify. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> huh? It's a very, very, it's a very deep experience. This, it's, it's, I'm reduced to nothingness, to nothing. So now I'm open. So now I'm reduced to nothing. I'm nothing. Why do we daven for that? Who wants their soul to be like dust? <laughs> Every day we daven. At the end, God, protect my tongue from evil. That's a very nice tefillah. Protect my lips from speaking deceitfully. Very nice. Those who curse me. Remember this in the end of davening. 
It's a very nice piece in Davin, a beautiful piece. Maybe people after Shmaneser, their ADHD already kicked in. They don't have Koyach Velikainitzer. But a is a very special tefillah. It comes from Gemara Brachas, Daf Yudzayin. Also Rav, I think also Rav, if I'm not mistaken. I have to look, I think. I miss Am Brachas. Huh? Sekenzayin Rav, Zakhsta. Chvesa Sekenzayin. Shaila Zipsi is. You mind giving me a Brachas? This affected how was a Russia. We're not talking... We're talking that Esther tuned into a place in her of the Kayach of Mesiris Nefesh. Once you're operating with the level of Mesiris Nefesh, you're a different person. It's not that she lost her creativity. She gained the deepest creativity. She became a channel. What's Mesiris Nefesh? Mesiris Nefesh means, not that I'm a Meshugana. Mesiris Nefesh means that I operate on a level of Ein Saif. I operate as a channel for infinity. I give up my soul. What does it mean, Mr. Nefesh? It's like my soul experiences the same level of intimacy it had pre-being concealed by the body. You tune into that level of oneness, like we learned in the previous Maimah, Yechida Shabbat Nefesh, right? There's Nefesh, Ruach, Neshama. There's Chaya and there's Yechida. Nefesh is action, Ruach is emotion, Neshama is understanding, Chaya is seeing clear, clearly, and then Yechida is oneness. And in Yechida there's no conflict, there's no, there's no opposite. <laughs> In Yechidah, there's no, as we would say, there's no trauma in Yechidah. <laughs> no, no trauma. There's really... And then no one went through it the way she did. Esther went through it more than anybody. Because everybody else, they were still in their environment. Listen, it was um, not to underestimate what Jews went through. Every Jew was, a, was, a, was, was destined to be murdered. And they had no physical way of, of saving themselves. So that, that, that was the point. Everything was lost. But Esther was in the lion's den. You know, she had to be with Achashvedish. She had to smile to Achashvedish after the decree came out. She couldn't sit and say, She didn't sit in shul eating herring and saying, She was entertaining this Barasha Madrush. And Haman too, because he was the man. You know, he was the, he was the greatest minister. There. So she was in the lion's den, really. The Kasher of Adati of Adati. Not just spiritually, but physically. Not just emotionally, but mentally on every level. And that's Esther, concealment. The Gemara says in Megillah, the Gemara says, Rabbi Shubhan Levi says, when she was going into Achashvedesh, she felt that the Shekhinah left her. And that's when she said, Keli, Keli, Lama Azaftani. So that's the ultimate, ultimate avadity. You, you abandoned me, you neglected me. That's what she felt. Because she felt that the Shekhinah left because it was a base at Tzlamim, it was full of Tzlamim. And she was going into this guy. So there was no, no, uh, no element of Kedusha here. Hashem's name is completely absent. And it says, that Tafka then, she received Ruach HaKodesh. Love, love, Hilbishta Ruach HaKodesh, it says in Medrash. But what's Ruach HaKodesh? A different type of Ruach HaKodesh. The Ruach HaKodesh of Anoichi, that's beyond names. The Ruach HaKodesh of Adaloyad. And at that moment, she became a channel for something else. To reduce to nothing, you're open for everything. Because nothing is no thing. When I'm no thing, then I can be connected to everything. Because the Ein Saif is not a thing. So how do I touch no thing? As long as I hold on to things, that's yesh. I'm, I'm reduced to no thing. It's called ayin. If you're re I'm reduced to no thing, now you're a channel for everything. But it's not, it's, it's not a rosy experience, you know. Oh, nothing. Because <laughs> no, no thing is, is a painful experience. Because it's... I, I, I lost, I, I feel like I lost everything. And that's what, rebir that's what rebirth is. That's what birth is. It's like the sea decomposing in the earth to be recreated as a tree. If the sea doesn't decompose, it never becomes a tree. It remains a very nice sea. It's a beautiful sea. It remains intact. And that's what real Mesidus Nefesh means. The person learns the art of transcendence and embraces it. And this was deeper than Matan Torah, because Matan Torah was also Parchanish Masa, was also Mesiris Nefesh. was also the soul was in touch with the ultimate truth, Yechidosh Ben Nefesh. But it was all a gift. Put him, nobody gifted anybody anything. Put him, you saw the Jew. Put him, you saw this is you. It's you. You're not a channel for God. You're, you're an embodiment of Ein Saif. You don't even have to be given anything. It's you. 
in a way, it's very hard because me, give me, give me, give me revelation. No, there's something deeper than giving you revelation. And that is you have you. You are the greatest revelation. You are the miracle that you're looking for. You know, I'm looking for this miracle, that miracle. Esther understood at that moment, she is the miracle. She is the miracle she was looking for. It's a, it's a shift in consciousness that can't be described in words. I know I'm talking about it. But she became that miracle. She was the greatest miracle of Purim. That's the Miyadeya. And then it manifested itself in, in so many other ways. That was, I think, the main, uh, the main point that, we tried to, that, we, uh, that we're learning about. Okay, so now let's finish this paragraph. We're page 125, the line starts, Hametzias. It's like 10 lines from the bottom. You see, V'nafshi ka'afel ha'kaltiya. And because of this paradox coming together, on one hand, they touched the highest point of truth, but they were in the lowest point. On every level, they were spiritually. And therefore also religiously and socially. So there was an oimek tachas, which means being deep, deep down in the abyss, and yet they touched the highest truth. So therefore they touched something that even was even greater than matan taira, the Purim affirms matan taira. As the Gemara says, Usually, these lights don't come into Kalim, they don't come into vessels, they remain aloof. Like we learned Latin in the previous Maimah, Reish is Goyim HaMolek Tavshin Tasvav, the previous Purim Maimah that we learned, that you have Koiches Pnimim and Koiches Makifim. Koiches Pnimim means faculties that are integrated. Mm-hmm. It's called Pnimi. It comes into a structure. Koiches Makifim means like, this, like things that are subconscious, superconscious. They don't have a vessel. So they remain above vessels. It's called in Kabbalah Makif. Makif doesn't mean surrounding physically. Makif means it could be inside, but it's in a way that it's not felt consciously by the recipient because it's transcendent energy. L'chayda, touching something beyond names, is a reason it has no name because you can't articulate it. The Chiddush of Purim then is that it didn't remain in a disengaged ascetic way. It came into Kalim. It came into integration. And that's why Purim, it's not a day when you disengage. You disengage. On the contrary, whatever we do a whole year with our body, I'm, I'm, with our body, on Purim, we do even more. The mitzvah of Purim, as he says, is mishta v'simcha v'yamta. In other words, it's not like Yom Kippur. The person is disengaged. You disengage. You don't eat, and you don't. All the things that are survival for the body, we don't do on Yom Kippur. We take off for day. You need to eat. Yeah, you don't eat. You need to drink. You don't drink. Rechitza is bathing, and sicha is anointing, and putting on shoes, and 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 tashmash amitah relations. It's all forbidden on Yom Kippur. Why? Because it's a day indeed of transcendence. It's a day that you touch Yechidah, the fifth. We learned about the five tefillahs of Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the only one that has Ne'ilah. So there's an element of disengagement. Purim is not that way. Purim is the opposite. Purim is a day of presence within the body, within the physical world. In a way you would say that Purim is the most physical day of the whole year. So he's saying the reason it's the most physical day is because it's really the most spiritual day. The Chiddush of Purim is that it was so real, it was so authentic, that it could come into Kalim also. Because it came from Yisrael Siddhartha, it came from them, and it came from them being in the lowest place, not in the highest place, so therefore it was so authentic, it was visceral, it could be integrated in Kalim. Because it came completely from them. So because it came completely from them, they became, they became vessels for infinity, which is a contradiction. How could you be a vessel for infinity? If it's infinity, there's no vessel. There's bitla kalim. Adaloyada. The Chiddush of Purim is that the Adaloyada comes in into kalim. Into mishta, simcha, yamtif. So I'm dealing with food, I'm dealing with stock. It's a whole day. It's <laughs> However, you celebrate your Purim, everyone. Uh, but the Nakuda is it's not a day of um, I'm sitting in heaven. 
Certainly, if you have kids who got to give shalach manas to half of months, you're certainly not sitting in heaven. You're stuck in traffic. <laughs> it's like, this is put him, this is put him. I have to be in a car there going, this person there, taking a picture here, taking a picture there. <laughs> But it's an akuda pnimis. It's an akuda. This is an akuda pnimis. It so, was so deep that it was it was it was real. It was completely from them. Why? Because it was zerusah lasata. It wasn't the mountain coming down. It was an arousal from below, and it came from being in the lowest place. So therefore, whatever came out came into the lowest place, because it came from that place. It wasn't something that's abstract. You know, something that's gifted to you from above. It remains ultimately something above, something you fought for. And it came to you from being in the hitting rock bottom, from the Hashmet Ladagalabin, you own that forever. Unless you willingly abandon it, but that you own. You all know what I mean probably, right? What you fight for from the lowest place is yours. It's not anybody else's, it's yours. You know, you paid, you paid, your, your, you paid your fee. The ticket is yours. Nobody gifted you the ticket. The seat that you have, it's your seat. That was the Chiddush of Purim. Zion. Siv Zion. Al Pisa, Yuvan Achille, Ben Kalamaydim, Lamea Purim, Shakalamaydim, I said, and Libatal, Vimea Purim, and Tail and Loyal. We know, come back, we now come back to what the Medrash says. The difference of all the holidays in Purim, that all the Mayadim, all the festivals are going to be nullified when Mashiach comes and Mashiach, and Yimea Purim not. And the question, of course, was Torah is not going to be changed. And he explained that it was like Shraga Betira, like a candle in daylight, which even though the candle is burning, it's eclipsed by the powerful sun. So now we'll understand what's the difference. Why put him yet? And they not. So put him will also be nullified in that sense. Nullified in the sense that it won't be so significant. The Hine in his buyer, there we explained earlier, Shatam, a portion should call a made him a sitting lip bottle of fish, Miss Adreva, Tava Vasim, Hidala, said Lover, Tia Tava Vasim, Shalamaya, Dim Kishraga Betiera. The Hine of Fisha Kainu Beruchni, Shalagabe, Agilia, Lukushi, Lost, said Lover, Meshachim, call you Mesa Shana, Ye Hoshev, Agilia, Lukush, Shalamaya, Dim Kishraga Betiera. So we explained the literal reason is that the tremendous abundance, goodness, and joy that's going to be when Mashiach comes is going to be so powerful that the goodness and the joy of all the holidays will be like a candle burning in the midday, in the, mid, in the afternoon. Betiara means when the sun is shining in light. But it's not just physically, there'll be so much abundance that the Simcha of Yom Tif is eclipsed. It's also spiritually that way. That's the main thing. Because there's going to be such a Gili Elikus, a revelation of, the, of infinity, of truth, of oneness, of godliness. Throughout the entire year when Mashiach comes, this will be the so to speak, the default state of consciousness, so the godliness that is revealed on your holidays, even to the most sensitive soul whose antennas absorb the gili of the mayadim, because every holiday is a gili alakus. It will be like shraga betiyara. It will be like a candle in the burning midday. Relative, in other words, its potency is, is eclipsed because of you have the sunlight. For Inyim Bazer, what's the explanation? Is the Av Shakala Mayadim Mayadim La Simcha had a calling Yoni Amayadim Mididivagabala. Now we'll understand the explanation of this. All the Yamim Taivim, they're called Mayadim La Simcha. They're all days of joy. Simcha, there's a mitzvah of Simcha. Simcha by definition means that it transcends your regular, com- your regular uh, box, your regular structure. It's an expression, Simcha Pairetz Geder. Simcha breaks boundaries. You see, when people are very joy, are very joy, the regular Gdarim, the regular boundaries, they can free themselves from them. But nonetheless, the concept of Yom Tif has a measurement and has a limitation. Because the Mayadim is one of the mitzvahs. The mitzvahs that were given when the, when the Torah was given. The Mesidus Nefesh of Matan Teira, the way the soul experienced truth by Matan Teira, which was beyond, because Ponim Beponim, Hashem spoke to them face to face, and that never repeated itself. You know, Matan Teira happened once, it never happened again. Matan Teira won't even happen when Mashiach comes. Matan Teira was a one time event. But as we said before, it was an arousal from above. It was a sarusa de la'ila. The Jews were transported to a place of clarity. Yeah, so it bypassed all the defense mechanisms. When you bypass the defense mechanisms, 
what happens? They come back. <laughs> there's moments that people, there's things people can do sometimes to bypass a lot of stuff, to bypass blockages, but they come back. They don't stay like that forever. Sometimes they come back with a vengeance to punish you. You bypassed me, I'm going to come back. So by Matan Taita, of course there was a clarity. But 40 days later, they made an eagle. Why'd they make an eagle? It wasn't worked through completely from within. And it couldn't. They just came out, they were slaves from Egypt, they were slaves, they were transported to another reality. Wow, they saw, <laughs> By Purim, nobody showed anybody anything. There was no, <laughs> It came from completely from within, and that's what he's going to explain the difference. By Matan Teir, there was a tremendous Mesidus Nefesh. But what happened? The godliness that was revealed, Lamata Bekalim, in vessels, is in Yanam of Tam Vedas. In Yanam of Tam Vedas means things that are more relatable to the human experience. To Tam Vedas. Tam Vedas means reason and knowledge. And therefore, there's a Medid of Ahagbala. And that's the Teir Mitzvahs that was given. And it's based on Kalim, it's based on, on living in vessels. Does the Darizal explains that all the Yom Tavim are connected to what's called Moichin the Ima, the Moichin of the mother, awareness of the mother, which is connected to Bina. There's Moichin the Abba and Moichin the Ima. So Darizal says in Priyat Chaim that the Yom Tavim are Moichin the Ima. Ima is the mother, Bina, which basically represents containers. Bina contains the epiphany of Chachma. That's what's called Havana Vasaga, like we learned in the previous moment. Nisham is connected to Bin. When Mashiach comes, it says, Yeshaya Hanavi says in chapter 30, Kanef, Yikanef comes to the word Kanaf, like Hakanaf, Psiltchelis, a garment. Kanaf, like Dalit Kanfas. Yikanef Oidmerecha means your teacher will not be eclipsed any longer, will not be behind garments. Yikanef Oidmerecha. In other words, there'll be a gilia lekuz shalamaylem in the day of The pure infinity of reality will be revealed. So the finite experience of divinity within Caleb, in the presence of an infinite revelation of leikan of merecha, it's like lighting a candle in the daytime. Not that the candle is nothing. Not that the candle is uh, we dismiss the candle, but once you touch. That which is beyond Kalim, so that which is revealed through Kalim, it's a, what's the word? The best word is Shaga Betiara, it's like a candle in the sun. It's nice, it's Kishmak, at nighttime we love it, but in the daytime it just loses, it loses its relevance, it loses its potency. Why? Because you're touching something much more real, much more deep. So the mitzvahs are not going to be bottled because the, we're talking here about the, the feeling of simcha. The mitzvah itself is Hashem's will. It's pure infinity. But mayadim is the, is the experience of the simcha, the experience of the revelation. That's why it's called mayadim le simcha. In other words, it's about the experience of it. And the experience of it is an experience in Caleb. So that's the idea of shraga betiara. The Chiddush of Purim was, over there there was Mesiris Nefesh, to something that's beyond Tam Vedas. The Jewish people touch something that's beyond Tam, beyond reason, beyond Das, like we explained earlier, Adelayad. And thus they accessed a tremendously lofty divine light, and it came down in the vessels of feasting and joy, which are broad vessels. So here, he says there's something in Purim that's even greater than the Giluyim, than the revelations of La'asid, of Mashiach. The Navi Yirmiyo says, Mashiach comes, the Jewish people are going to come back with tears. They're going to come with Bechi, with tears. Yirmiyo Lamed Aleph, 31. Why? What's the idea of tears? Why is, it, why is anybody going to be crying? So some of Farshim say 
because sometimes in the time when the joy, you know, when the story is over, you start crying for all the pain. It's like, now you could start crying. <laughs> now that it's over, you could let yourself cry. He says there's also something, the truth of that, it's a true, it's a true insight, but there's something at the core of that itself. You see, sometimes a person has, experiences such a simcha, such a joy that you can't contain in your kalim, so you start crying. The tears are almost tears of gratitude. It's like unbelievable. It says in Zohar, and the, the, the Taz brings it in Erechayim, Rabbi Akiva was learning Shir Hashirim and he was sobbing. Zolgu Ein of Dmoyes. Tears were streaming from his eyes. Shir Hashirim is not a sad book. There's nothing sad in Shir Hashirim. I mean, there's a lot of drama. He hides from her, she hides from him. It's intense. But it's a very, it's, it's beautiful, it's full of love and affection. Kaihela Rabbi Akiva should cry. Shir Hashirim is a beautiful book of affection and love. The pshat is, Rabbi Akiva was experiencing such bliss in Shir Hashirim, it was beyond Kalim. And whatever is beyond Kalim, whatever is not integrated, you start crying. Crying is not always I'm crying on sadness. Crying is I'm crying, there's a, there's a, I'm overjoyed. It's tears of joy that come from a joy that I can't integrate, like this is beyond what I ever imagined. Beautiful. Tears are the sweat of the soul, the soul sweating, yeah. Zolguain of Dmayas. So it's that which comes out because it doesn't come, it doesn't, it's not integrated in the vessels. Because the Gilu, the revelation was beyond the vessels of Moichin, beyond the vessels of awareness, it came out in tears. Which tears represents that which can't be integrated in the Moichin, it's Moisre Moichin. That which the Moichin, so to speak, spits out. It's that which the brain says, I can't deal with this. And that's why tears are such an important release. Like sometimes tears are the most accurate description of what you're saying. Tell me, what are you saying? You start crying. Some people can't deal with it. Stop crying. Tell me what you want to say. No. I can't tell you what I want to say. Sometimes tears, right? We have to honor tears because tears, tears are saying, yeah, it's beyond Caleb. I have no words. You want me to put it in words? What, you want me to force it into Caleb? And this is both true in terms of pain and in terms of bliss. But there's a common denominator, a pain that I can't deal with, I can't integrate it. It's beyond me, it shatters me. It shatters me. I cry, that's what tears are, you start crying. It's not a decision, I'm now gonna cry. We're not talking about that. They used to, I think there's machzorim, we used to say, kan sarich lifkas, you know, here you have to cry. You know, there's the speaker who gets up, gives a drush and says, okay, I'm not going to tell a story and you should be crying while I tell it and here are the tissues. It's like a comedian who gets up and says, I'm now, you should be laughing. If the comedian has to tell you to laugh, we know how successful he is. Tears is, is, is a result of the experience that there's something here that I can't, I can't contain. It's not just a regular svada, you told me, a very geschmack, okay, nice. I can't contain it. Because I can't contain it, the tears are, ma- the tears are a manifestation of that which I can't contain in Caleb. So you have it in pain and you have it also in joy and it really touches the same point. It really touches the same point. It touches a place that's beyond Caleb. It's, 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 it's where, where, where something in me is shattered. You know, a person will talk about their expectations and their dreams for themselves or for their loved ones. And they'll talk about the grief, the grief of what was lost or what they think what was lost. And, and naturally a person starts crying. It's a visceral expression of the authenticity of an experience that you're not trying to put into a box. That's why you don't say, stop crying, stop crying. They say Reb Chaim Shmulevich was the Rosh Hashiva of Mir. So he went to Kei Rachel after the Six Day War. So they tell a story and he started to speak to her and he said, Mama Rachel, Reb Chaim Shmulevich was a very emotional person, a Bal Regesh. So he said, he told her, he said, Mama Rachel, Yirmiya Novi says, Mini mi bechi You could stop crying. 
You could stop crying. Your kids, your children are going to come back. Stop crying. He says, Cry. Don't stop crying. You don't tell somebody to stop crying because the tears, <laughs> the tears are expressing something very real. So Rabbi Akiva, learning Shirashidim, he experienced the secrets of Shirashidim. He started to cry. Zolgoen of the noise. Rabbi Akiva was a big Balmeichen. Rabbi Akiva was a big Balmeichen, but this was beyond his Meichen. So Rabbi Akiva himself started to cry. In other words, he was touched in a place that can't be contained. So when Mashiach comes, as Bibchi Yavayu, there's going to be so many tears because it's going to be unbelievable. It's something that can't be integrated. That's Bchi Yavayu. He says that this is a Chiddush of Purim. The Chiddush of Purim is Mashenkin be Purim Amshachu be Kalim Rechav in the Mishnah Vesimcha. Purim, the light is manifested in broad vessels of feasting and joy. Even those lights, the La'asad Lava, they won't be able to go into Kalim, and that's why it will trigger tears. On Purim, you say that it's Mishta Vesimchit comes into Kalim. So there's a something in Purim that they touched that even when Mashiach comes, it's going to be deeper. So not only will Purim not be a candle. In midday, the other Yamim Taivim, in the revelation of Alakus from Mashiach comes, it's like lighting a candle. Why? Because it's Alakus, the way it's revealed through Kalim, which is with a measurement, even though it's awesome and infinite relative to lower Kalim. But nonetheless, relative to the revelation of Mashiach, it's going to be like lighting a candle in the afternoon. Or I should say in the afternoon, midday. Shraga Batiara. Tiara is when the sun is in its brightest moment, it's over your head. Tiara means light. Tiara. In Aramaic. So in broad daylight, when the sun is shining, it's a beautiful day, there's no clouds eclipsing the sun, lighting a candle won't have that potency, that effectiveness. Purim won't be that way. He says, not only that, not only it won't be a candle, there's going to be something in the light of Purim that's even higher, than, deeper than the sun, so to speak. That by Mashiach, it says, Why? Because I could be a kiva crying by Shia Shidim. And put him, they touched something so deep from such a low place. They owned it so deeply. It's within it's within Caleb. The Adaloyada of Putim is within Caleb. But says it's within Caleb. It's a day when a Jew can be engaged in regular mundane life. Adarab. It's a mitzvah to eat and a mitzvah to drink and a mitzvah to send gifts of food and a mitzvah to give charity to the poor. In other words, the mitzvahs of Putim are mostly connected with engagement. Not a mitzvah to separate and, and uh, isolate and meditate. That should be Purim. Adalayada. The mitzvah of Purim is that you bring that Adalayada into the Kalim. They brought it into the Kalim. It became integrated, and that's why it became Yoy Mishta Vesimcha Mishloyach Manas. The highest, the highest, the deepest core could be expressed in regular life. That's the ultimate fusion. And that's a Chiddush. That's a huge Chiddush. Even the Gabi Laosid love it's a Chiddush. Even the Gabe, the messianic state of consciousness, do something novel here. It won't get so it won't be outshined, on the contrary. When Mashiach comes, Purim will still be not only relevant, and not only not obliterated, but there's something in Purim that we're going to need even when Mashiach comes. Now we come to Yom Kippur. By Yom Kippur it says, Yom Kippur is Kippurim, right? Yom HaKippurim, it's like Purim. For in Yom Bazad, he did be Yom HaKippurim, Ksiv Lifnei Hashem Titaro. By Yom Kippur it says, in Parshas Achirei Mois, Ki Yom Hazei Yichapar Aleichem Mekol Chatei Seichem, Lifnei Hashem Titaro. Literally it means, you shall become purified before God, in the presence of Hashem. The Alter Rebbe says in Lekut HaTayra, Lifnei Hashem also means before Hashem. Beyond Hashem, Lifne Hashem, Lifne Yudke Vavke Titoru. There's something on Yom Kippur that precedes Yudke Vavke. That's why you could be purified. Lifne Hashem Titoru because you're coming Lifne, Lifne as before, beyond Yud and He and Vav and He. That's the way Hashem is manifested and embodied, so to speak, through Yud and He and Vav and He. Lifne Hashem, when you touch that which is pre Yudke Vavke Titoru, now you'll be cleansed. That's what he says in the Kudat Torah in Parshas Achrei. That's us. Mavur b'zeh shazel gilu shenim shechupchin shalemay l'mishem asagdoshim. Yim kippur touching touches something beyond the holy names. Lamayla filu mishem havaya even beyond the name. There's many holy names. 
There's seven names that we're not allowed to erase. And then there's what's called Kinuyim, all the other names that we use for Hashem, like Chano, Racham. And then you have the seven main names, like Aleph, Hey, Yud, Hey, and Kale, and Yud, Kevavke, of course, and Alekim, and Shindal, and Yud. But Yud, Kevavke is called the Shema Mephirish. It's like the essential name. So this is Lifnei Hashem, even beyond Yud, Kevavke. Shemisham, Nimshech, Satara, Sheba, Allah, Shuvah. And from there comes the purity following tshuva, because all the sins, all the mistakes, can affect Yud and He and Vav and He. But Lifnei Hashem, beyond Yud Kevav Ketitaru, over there it's, you're completely clean, you're cleansed. Shazau al derech purim shabai nim shechem chinah shalamai la meshem es akdoshim shalachen lei niskru b'megila shem es akdoshim ela b'dem es bolvad kivun shazau chinah shalamai la meshem es lofnei Hashem. So now we understand the Medrash has one opinion that Yim Kippur is like purim. Because Yom Kippur is also a day when you touch that which transcends names. So that's why it's Yom HaKippurim. It's Kippurim. Purim, we said in the Megillah, you will not find Hashem's name even once, only hinted. Why? Not because God is not present. Haster Aster. But because it's Hanoichi Haster Aster. The concealment is coming from the fact that the names are not manifested. It's something beyond the name. Even beyond Lifnei Havaya, beyond Yudke Vavke. So now we right away see the similarity with Yom Kippur. Because Yom Kippur is Lifnei Hashem Titaru beyond Yudke Vavke. So the lack of names in the Megillah on one level is concealment. On another level it's the opportunity to touch that which is beyond names. That's the opportunity. That's Miyodeya. That's Loyada. I can't know. Yudke Vavke. There is some level of Yada. Obviously it's a much higher Yada. Remember Yada itself has infinite levels. But nonetheless, there's still an element of Yud, there's Hey, Vav, Hey, what we call Sviris, there's Chachma, there's Bina, there's Midas, there's Malchus. And then there's Lifnei Hashem. Lifnei Hashem, that's where Titaru, that's where the real healing comes, the real cleansing comes. So the Megillah on one level, there's concealment, Haster, Aster, but it's Anoichi Haster, Aster, right? The Anoichi, which is beyond names. Anoichi is I. And I, I don't have a name, I can't even articulate it. I can't articulate it in a name because it's beyond articulation. And that's what they touched in the Megillah. And that's what a person faces that type of concealment of lahashmid, lairagul, laabed, kasher, avadati, avadati. Everything is lost. It's not that Hashem is not present. It's that I have to touch the, I'm, 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 I'm empowered and invited to touch anoichi, the eye, the eye beyond names. It's beyond revelation. Not because there's no revelation. It's a completely different type of presence. It's a presence of a noichi, which is lifnei Hashem. But Yom Kippur, the Hamshach of Yom Kippur, the flow of Yom Kippur doesn't come into vessels. How do you experience Yom Kippur? What's the rhythm of Yom Kippur? It's called Chamisha Inuyim. The last Mishnah, the last chapter of Masechus Yuma is dedicated to the Chamisha Inuyim. Chamisha Inuyim means the five afflictions of Yom Kippur. The Torah says about Yom Kippur, V'yinisim es nafshei seichem. You should afflict your soul. So there's five forms of affliction. Basically, we don't eat and drink, and we don't bathe, and we don't anoint ourselves with oils, and we don't put on our shoes, and we disengage from physical relations. Those are known as the chamisha inuyim. What does that all represent? The common denominator is, as he puts it, heder hakelem. It's the absence of kelem. It's the disengagement of the regular, mundane routine of daily living. You eat, you drink, you wash up, you take care of your body, both in terms of the oils, in terms of what your body needs, in terms of the shoes. Shoes represents the relationship with the world. We wear shoes in order to be able to step on hard surfaces, right? So you need shoes. Especially if they didn't have paved roads and <laughs> everything, you know, you need shoes. And of course, Tashma Shamita, which is the the, the experience by which the world goes around and around and procreation and, uh, and, and, and the future of humanity. The Gemara says in Yuma that Anshe Knesset Sagdoyle tried to kill the, the temptation for, 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 for Arayas, the temptation for promiscuity and then uh, <laughs> they were looking for a fresh egg. They were looking for a fresh egg. <laughs> And they couldn't find. And they realize if you kill this one, Kalya Alma, the world will cease to exist. There was no, no eggs. No, no. 
the, root, the roosters were not fertilizing, uh, were not fertilizing the eggs. It was over. <laughs> In other words, don't you can't you can't mess with this. It's it's how it's how Hashem created the world. You know you can't destroy it. Yom Kippur. One day we go away from it. So it's a day of Heder Hakelim. Heder Hakelim is a very beautiful term. Heder Hakelim means the absence of Kelim. We of Tafka stay away from Kelim. We stay away from the containers in which we must live life. Somebody says, I'm going to live life without eating. It's too much for me. So it's a headache. Not drinking, not sleeping. It's like a person makes a shvua. I'm going to make a shvua. I'm not eating for seven days. I'm not sleeping for three days. So the halach is, the Rambam brings in the shvuas, you know. Malkin, I say, the altar, and you give him a meal. You don't have to wait seven days. You can give him malkus right now and let him eat a good breakfast. Let him eat right away. It's fine. In other words, you're touching things that are impossible. Kela means the structures in which we have to live life. I can't disengage those structures because that's embodiment. It's like, I'm not going to breathe. You're not going to breathe. The neshama can't live without the keli of the guf, and the guf has kela and has structures. The Kedusha of Yom Kippur, though, is experienced dafke in a day where we disengage from the kela. Obviously, for one day, we don't do Yom Kippur every day because a person has to eat. And a person has to drink, and it's all the other things. But that's the Chiddush of Yom Kippur, that to touch Lifnei Hashem, it's through Heder HaKelem. There's a certain asceticism, a precious, a sense of asceticism that is, that is practiced on Yom Kippur. The key, the key when she nina mesidus nefesh ene babe poil ba guf hagashmi, lochena am shachi binyan shali nuyim, veloi binyanam shal kelem, binyanam gash. Because since the mesidus nefesh of Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is also mesidus nefesh. It's lifne hashem. But the mesidus nefesh, the connection of the soul in Yom Kippur, didn't come viscerally through the body. So therefore, how is it expressed? It's expressed in things that are disengaging you from the body, from the physicality, not through Kalem. Mashen can put him, be put him, sha'oz ha'yin, yin amasidus nefesh, be payel, l'chei nimshachim ha'yik oise ha'yoyris ha'yoyisir el yoyinim be Kalem shal yonim gashmem, mishta v'simcha. Yim kip put him, we spoke about the mesidus nefesh, it was mesidus nefesh be payel. The Jews surrendered their souls in actuality. It wasn't just on a meditation, it wasn't just a transcendent awareness, Matan Taita was also Mesidus Nefesh Repel, but it was Parchanish Muslim because of the revelation from above. Yom Kippur is a day of very deep spiritual awareness and introspection. Touching the Gdusha of that day, it's it says, the very day atones. But put him, it all came through the guf, in the guf. The Jewish body was being threatened. La Hashmid, La Abed was not their souls, it was Chas V'Shalom, their gufim. It was the guf of the Jew that touched the truth. That was the Chiddush of Purim. It wasn't a gzeir on the soul only. It was a gzeir on the guf. He wanted to kill the guf. And that's what it was, it was aroused. They felt everything in their bodies. The lahash medlada galabid was a mesidus nefesh in the guf. It was a mesidus nefesh, but poil, it was in a very physical, visceral way. They didn't abandon their Judaism to save themselves. They said, we're going to remain complete Jews. And they experienced, therefore, with their guf, with their kalim. And as we said before, it came completely from within and it came completely from below and it came completely from a place of complete, what would seem like complete hopelessness. So what happens here? What happens here is the highest oiders come into Kalim of Inyanam Gashma. So their physicality expanded to infinity. The guf became a channel for, 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 for everything. And that's why Purim is deeper than Matan Taita. That's the mile of Purim. Even deeper than Yom Kippur. This ultimate fusion of Purim, this was a Chiddush that happened then. This explains, this can explain the two opinions in the Medrash. If Yom Kippur is going to be like Purim, and it won't be nullified when Mashiach comes, or it will be. So there's two opinions in the Medrash. One view is Yom Kippur is just like Purim. Yom Kippur will not be like a candle in the sunlight. Because as we said, Yom Kippur is Lifnei Hashem Titaru. The light that shines is higher than the names of Hashem. So in that sense, it's like Purim. So it's not going to be a candle in daylight, in, in, in sunlight. Rather, it's not going to be eclipsed at all. 
but the first view says the first view is that since the revelation of Yom Kippur does not come into vessels like Purim, it's not that ultimate fusion of truth that you feel it viscerally within your vessels of the guf. That's not what Yom Kippur is. Therefore, that opinion says only Purim won't be eclipsed. Yom Kippur will be eclipsed. It will be like a candle in sunlight. Why? We said when Mashiach comes, it's also going to be they're going to come with tears. In other words, it's going to be beyond the limitations of Kalim, so it's similar to Yom Kippur. He says, true, but after the tears of Mashiach, they're going to be able to integrate it into Kalim. With Yom Kippur, it remains above Kalim. That's the Avayda of Yom Kippur. It's not the floor of Yom Kippur, that's the Avayda of Yom Kippur. And that's why this opinion says that there's something absolutely unique in Purim. Nothing can surpass Purim, not even Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is Yom HaKip Purim, it's like. But the fact that you say it's like means it's not this. Because Purim has something that Yom Kippur doesn't have. And even when Mashiach comes, where you're going to have this ultimate gili, but still the Yirmiyo says, They're going to come with tears. And in Purim, as we said, it touched every nakuda of their physical selves, where there's the complete fusion of the infinite and the finite, where the Adelayada is integrated in the body, the guf. It seems like a very physical day. The reason it's a very physical day is not because it's not the holy day. It's because it's holy beyond holy, it's beyond names. It doesn't have to look holy. There's two types of holiness, and that's really the point. There's Kedusha that looks holy, and there's holiness that is so holy it doesn't have to look holy. When somebody has to look holy, you know that their holiness is very limited. <laughs> Real holiness doesn't have to look holy. And that's really what happens with Esther. If you look at Esther's life, it's a very unholy life. It's a life of absolute, you would say, absolute tumah. Not by her fault, but that's the fact. And that's what it means. It's not touching names. Sometimes there's a holiness in life. It's, it looks holy. It's, that's what not Hashem's name is revealed. Elikim, Avaya, this name. In other words, there's a gilui of Shemus. You feel the elikus, you feel, you see, you palpable holiness. Everybody has that in their life, but there's also situations where you're thrown into a situation where you, it looks like it's very unholy. Whatever that may mean for you. But in other words, there's no names shining. There's no revelations. I may be stuck in Achashvedish's palace. It's a situation I'm dealing with that seems very, very unholy. Is that holy? In many ways, that's a deeper form of holiness. It's so holy that it doesn't look like holiness. It's all pervasive. It's real. You become the holiness. You're the miracle that you're looking for. Purim looks like, you know, the most, the most physical day, the most unholy day, because it's the most holy day. It's the day that represents that holiness doesn't have to look holy. You hear what you hear? Holiness doesn't have to look holy. It can look very unholy, but it's holy. Sometimes it's more holy than anything else. You know, sometimes you're dealing with a situation, you're dealing with a person, you're engaging in a situation that seems very, very unholy, very profane, and it's taking you down. It's taking you down only if you call it down. But maybe it's taking you up. So you say, yeah, but what's here? There's nothing here. There's no, there's no names here. Maybe the etzim is here. There's no names. The name is not here. Don't get fooled by it. It's lifnei Hashem. Maybe it's not names. Maybe it's beyond names. This is a very edle, very edle inyan. That's what we learned in Basi Lagani. There's lamayla adin kes, there's lamata adin tachlas. Atziya sha'oil. I come into the Sha'il to the Gehenim. Ineka, you're there. You're there. There's a Taich in Chesidus. He says in Tehillim, Kuflamat has Im Esak Shamaim. If I go to the heavens, if I ascend to heaven, Sham Ata, there you are. Vatsiya Sha'il, if I find my mattress in the abyss, Hineka, 
that's you. You see the difference? He says, If I go to heaven, Sham over there, Atta, you are. Vatsiya Sha'oil, he should say, Sham Gamata. He says, Hineka, you. <laughs> That's you. <laughs> Sometimes in the Sha'oil, you touch something that you don't touch in Shamayim. Im Esak Shamayim, Sham over there, Atta. Oh, where is he? Okay, oh, it's heaven. Yeah, fine, there, 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 you'll find it there. By the, sta- by the stander. <laughs> there in that room, you'll see the Kedusha. Vatsiya Sha'oil, Hineka. It's not even Shamata. This is you. What are you talking about? It's the opposite of you. If the you is a name, then you're right. If the you is beyond names, so then it's Hineka. That is Hineka. But I have to go to a place beyond names. It's not a place of no Kedusha. It's a place where the Kedusha is not expressed in Kedusha. Why? Because it comes from a place that's beyond the names, the revelations of holiness. So usually this comes out beyond Caleb. It could come out beyond Caleb. The Chiddush of Purim was that it was completely integrated. This was Esther's life, and therefore it became the life of the Jewish people then. That from the Chasher of Adati of Adati, from the Hashmid Laragul Abed, from Sha'ol Tachtis, from the lowest, lowest place, spiritually and physically, they touched through their mysterious nefesh, the Adel Yada, they touched Atzmos, Hashem's essence itself, which is beyond names. And that's why the Megillah has no names, and that's the Yehudi. And thus, this opinion says, even Yom Kippur, despite the fact that Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the year, and it's Lifnei Hashem, and it creates a cleansing for everything. Because the person reaches that space, you still can't compare it to Purim. It's Kippur, Purim, but it's not Purim. And therefore, Mashiach comes, it's, you could say, Shraga Betiara, it will still be a candle in the sunlight. Where Purim, nobody says that. Purim, everyone holds lawyer bottle. So Yom Kippur itself, there's two opinions. When you say two opinions here, it means, Elu Vela Divra Elakim Chaim. It means there's this aspect, that it's both true. There's an element of Purim, of Yom Kippur, that's mamish like Purim. And there's also a Maila in Yom Kippur, that's obvious. You know, the revelation of Yom Kippur is Yom Kippur. We're not going to start canceling out Yom Kippur and turn Yom Kippur into Purim and say, hey, let's have a party Yom Kippur to bring it into Caleb. It's not something you joke with. In other words, <laughs> huh? in Medrash, in Medrash Rabbah, Med- right in the beginning, he, right, if you look at the beginning of the Medrash Mishle Pedic Tes, when Yalkut Shemayni Mishle Tov Tov Kuf Mem Dalad. So first the Medrash brings the Kayal Amayadim Telem besides Purim. The first page, 118, you'll see uh, he brings the whole, the whole Arichas in the Medrash. And then he brings Vaiter that Af Yem Kippur, there's a view that Af Yem Kippur, and he brings a Pasuk, okay. So he says, And this is true, in, and it's literally true in every person's life. In other words, we sometimes touch things that seem very, very unholy. Sometimes people are dealing with things in their own family. And they have to go down to places that are very challenging, are very difficult. Where's the Ketusha? Where's the holiness? And you have to know that sometimes that is deeper than everything else, not because it looks holy, because it doesn't have to look holy to be holy. That's the word. Like everything, it could be misconstrued, yeah. If somebody wants, they can misconstrue everything. <laughs> We're talking about authenticity. We're talking about a real person. We're not trying to misconstrue. If you want to misconstrue this, you can misconstrue this. Everything is holy. I'll have bacon and eggs for breakfast because it doesn't look holy. Right? We're not... Even in Adelaide, you don't have to say it. No, in other words, when you say these words, like, if it looks unholy, it means it's more holy. It means it's more holy if it's Dirats and Hashem. It doesn't mean if it's, it's more holy because uh, my Yitzhahara is, 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 is hungry today. Huh? That's the point. Ha'adam yire le'inayim v'ashem yire le'levav. Right? Shmuel Anavi went to Korone David. But before that, he, he first, it was Aliyah. Aliyah was the, was the oldest son of Yishai. Huh? So he looked at him, you know, he was tall, he was handsome, he looked beautiful. So Hashem said, Al-Tabit al Mareyu. Don't look, don't look so deceiving. Ha'adam yirilei na'yim v'ashem yirilei You see with your eyes, I see the heart. But on a deeper level it means what looks like Kedusha is you take see it. It's the Shemus. But there's something sometimes that's a deeper form of Kedusha. It's not expressed as holiness. If you asked Esther, where, who was Esther, where was Esther? She was stuck. What was she stuck? She wasn't stuck. She was manifesting something beyond Shemus.
And that's what you have to know. Sometimes I'm in that place. And the feeling is kasher avadati avadati. But here's the Chiddush. Only when you feel kasher avadati avadati, that's when you can access this. In other words, if Esther would have gone into the palace with tremendous simcha, this is amazing. I'm the first lady of the Persian Empire. <laughs> Much better than any Jewish shidduch. What do I, what do I, what do I a guy, guy get $100 a month sitting in Kailu? Now I have access to everything. Right? If that was her feeling, this, this whole maimah wouldn't apply. Esther went in kashravadati avadati. Ekele kele lama azavtani. So that's why she remained connected. She remained connected. She didn't become intoxicated. That's what it means that unholiness can be holy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Reb Josh, Reb Jonathan, Yainison. So now that the mimer is coming to its conclusion, it seems like come holy in an unholy place is a process of every. Yeah. So that's the Purim, that's the Purim and Kippur. Yom Kippur, you're in the holiest place right. to achieve greatness. It's not that. Right. It's not a finish. You have right. everything holy. Whereas Purim, to achieve holiness on Purim, when all this is going around, it's like Esther in the palace. Yeah. To achieve holiness then is yeah. a hoicha hoicha madrega. Yeah. But the, the, the power of Purim is that it's not a hoicha madrega. It's not a high madrega. <laughs> it's the highest, and therefore it could look like the lowest. Right. And that's the cloud. When you're in the real, re, most high, in the highest places, it could look like the lowest places. We have here in the Shia, the founder of Kesher Nafshi is sitting here, Reb Gedalia Miller. So you'll ask him, right? You'll ask him, and he'll tell you that from his experience with many parents, sometimes they're dealing with situations that are very, very challenging, very difficult. They feel like they're going down into the lowest places to be there for their children who fell into the lowest places. Everything about their education is telling them I am betraying Torah, I'm betraying God, I'm betraying everything. And what's the MS? The MS is that they're touching the deepest part of their souls. And how do you know? You see how their children are affected from that. It's the moment, you know, when Moshe breaks the luchas, like Yashikoycha Chosha Shibarta, right? He breaks the luchas, and that's how the whole Torah ends. He breaks the luchas, and Hashem says, thank you. And that's how the whole Torah ends. That's how the Torah ends. La'ini kol Yisrael, you broke the luchas. It's something to be embarrassed about. You broke the luchas, fine, hide it. Let's hide the story. You want to write it, write it somewhere. You end the Torah. That's like almost like Simcha's Torah. That's what we finished. La'ini kol Yisrael. Rashi says, what's la'ini kol Yisrael? He broke the luchas in front of everybody. Really? That's how you end the whole Torah? Like that's the highest level of Moshe Rabbeinu. You know, it's like you'll talk about a doctor, right? He, he's the doctor for 70 years. He saved, I don't know, uh, 50,000 patients. And say one last story, okay? There was a patient who came to him, Chaim Yankel, and he cut off both of his legs. Chazak, chazak, v'niz chazak. And, you know, somebody said, you know, the, the patient died, but the surgery was successful. It was an unbelievable surgery, you know? They used to say in Yiddish, Nifter pifter, abigezunt. Says nifte gevaren, nifte pifte, abi gezunt. You know, nifte pifte. The main thing is healthy, abi gezunt. Moshe had to break the luchas, fine, but he amputated, he broke the Torah. That's not his celebration. Come on, talk about Yitzias Mitzrayim, Kriyas Yamsov. Man, Moshe did some stuff. You, you don't have to look for a resume. Some people you have to find. You know what to be masped. <laughs> Moshe was nothing missing, but this is the nekuda. The nekuda is that when Moshe broke the luchas, he saved Klal Yisrael. Rashi explains that he broke the ksuva. It was tearing up the ksuva to save the Jewish people. In other words, Moshe Rabbeinu taught that there comes moments where you break everything you know. But when you break everything you know, you touch the essence of the Jew. You touch the essence of God. You touch the essence of Torah. And Moshe said, Mecheni no If you don't forgive them, erase me from the Sefer Torah. And Taka'ata Tetzava doesn't have his name. It doesn't have his name. It has his essence. It's beyond names. Va'ata Tetzava. So sometimes in life we're, we feel like we're breaking the luchas. Again, this is something you do because Hashem wants, not because my Yetzirah wants to break the luchas. So we're, we're not, you have to be careful with that. Again, I, I told you, everything could be misconstrued. Purim is a day of elikus, it's a day of Kedusha. But what's the Kedusha? The Kedusha doesn't look like necessarily asceticism. On the contrary, Mishta Vesimcha, because they created Kalim for Ein Saif. 
Kalim for Ein Soif. That's the biggest Chiddush. To be able to be naturally and organically infinite. It's very hard because it doesn't look, doesn't look weird. It doesn't look heavenly. You're not spaced out, so to speak. You're spaced in. You're in a space. You're not spaced out. Right? It's, a, it, you, it, it's very, very contained. And that's the ultimate Kedusha. The ultimate Kedusha doesn't have to look like it. He's having close on Nefesh. What's going on? Kesher Nafshi, Reb Gedalia Miller. It's a compliment. He usually doesn't sit at a shear. <laughs> He's saying he knew when to come. The wind blew him in. Okay? Yeah, holiness does not always look holy. Sometimes it looks very unholy and it's much more holy than a lot of other things. MS Reb Gedalia? And you have to know, it's not always people feel kasher avadati avadati. I lost everything. You know, you could go to a Shabbos table, right? I'll give you a simple example. Shabbos table looks very, very holy. Looks very, very holy. Everything is done perfectly, but there's not a moment of authenticity or connection. Some people are sitting at the table; they feel completely alienated and forced. There's a mountain over their head. If you sit at the table, good. And if not, this, this mountain is coming over you. So you sit, and you sit with your garments, and you sit nicely. The moment they can get away from it, they'll be gone. You have another shopper's table, you look at it, and all the regular beautiful things at the table are not happening. But what's happening is there's connection. There's emotional attunement. There's attachment. There's authenticity. In other words, there's someone whose heart is burning with love. And the only way your heart can be burning with love is if you're touching God. If you touch God, your heart burns with love because you see the godliness in other people. And there's that love and that affection and it's there and it doesn't look uh, any, like anything magical. It may seem sometimes not Shabbos Dick, but there's a real connection there. There's real attachment there. And that's where miracles happen. So you start judging yourself. This is Shabbos. This is Yom Tev. Like I spoke the other day about the Seder. This is a Seder. <laughs> Seder has to look a certain way. How do you know what it's supposed to look like? Maybe it has to look after. How do you know what it's supposed to look like? It's supposed to look like what Hashem wants it to look like. What does Hashem want it to look like? You know how you know what Hashem wants it to look like? Exactly what it looks like. <laughs> People say, how do I know what Hashem wants my Shabbos table to look like? Exactly the way it looks. That's why He wants it to look. And the question is, will you show up? God is here. Will you show up? And what do we God is here? There's nothing here. He's here. The question is, can you be here? Can you get out of your ego and get off your horse and you show up? He's here. He's here. Show, now you show up. You show up. No, that, that's, the, that's the Nakuda. In every person's life, it's manifested in so many different ways. But that's what put him touched. Put him touched this, this space. And it touched it in Esther and therefore it touched it in the whole Klai Yisrael. Let's finish the last paragraph. Ches. This is what the Pasuk says in the days of Purim. will never leave from the Jewish people. And the memory of Purim will never be eliminated from our children. Just like in those days of Purim, the Jewish people stood in a tnuah, in a moment, in a movement, in a motion of Mesidus Nefesh. And Mesidus Nefesh, not in thought, but in actuality. The whole year, that's what we explained, that the whole year from the Gzeira till Purim happened, there was a whole year that the Jewish people were in a completely altered state of consciousness. They were targets of annihilation and they were preparing for it. Nobody knew how it's going to turn out at the end. And it was easy to run away, but they remained fully present. What does that feel like? What does that do to you? <laughs> it's death of ego, but in a way that it's in your body. <laughs> Usually to experience death of ego, you go out of your goof a little bit. You bypass stuff, because death of ego I can't have in my goof. The Chiddush of Purim was, that by Matan Torah there was also death of ego, and the souls flew away. By Purim, the souls flew away in the body. <laughs> a death of ego in your body. They were embodied, and a whole year they were in a different state of consciousness. 
They were, they were in a sense of this, this, is the, this is the Pshat. And he says they reached a place that's beyond Teirah and Mitzvahs and it's the source of Teirah and Mitzvahs. That's, the, that's what that means. It's higher than Matan Teirah. They touched the source of Teirah and Mitzvahs. The source of Teirah and Mitzvahs could be manifested in something that doesn't always look like a Mitzvah. So this is something we say, The Megillah says these days, are remembered and experienced. Bechol der vader, the Rizal says niskarim venasim means by remembering it, you re-experience it. Niskarim venasim. In other words, it's not just a memory, it's venasim, it's an experience, it's an internal experience. The main thing of a yamtif is not talking about it, it's the experience of it in my own life. Shabachol der vader, yachol kalechad vechad lagil adar gazu, every generation, it opens up the vista for each person. To touch the space, the Gemara says in Megillah that Yud Gimel Mardechai is called Yehudi, even though he comes from Shevet Ben Yamin, because he's Kaifer Bavay Dezara. He denies Avay Dezara. He's Maida Belake Yisrael. He's Maida Bechala Tayra Kol. That's why he's called Yehudi. So this idea is that Yehudi is Kaifer Bavay Dezara. What does it mean, Kaifer Bavay Dezara? It's not Kaifer Bavidazara that he doesn't do Avidazara. Kaifer means that he denies the Metzias of Avidazara. It's a deeper vart. <laughs> Rebbe once explained this at a Purim for Bereng Tafshin, Lamar Aleph. Kaifer Bavidazara means there's no Metzias of Avidazara. There's a Jew doesn't do Avidazara. Kaifer Bavidazara means I deny its Metzias. What does it mean he denies it? He doesn't see, an, he sees in everything Einoid Mulvade. In other words, I don't see, I don't recognize that there's any Metzias that's real outside of Kedusha. It doesn't exist. Kaifer in the Metzias of Avedazal, it's much deeper. That's the Chiddush of Purim. That any other Metzias outside, he doesn't acknowledge it as a real thing. It's an opportunity, it's a catalyst, it's a springboard, it's a challenge, it's an obstacle to bring something out. He doesn't recognize that darkness has an independent real reality. That's Kaifer Bavay Dezara. That's already a very, very powerful state of consciousness. And that Haman couldn't deal with. <laughs> you want to fight me, fight me, but you don't even acknowledge that I exist. <laughs> At least say that I exist and you're my enemy and light fight. No, you don't exist. Ain't no Well, I don't know. I'll show you I exist. I'll kill, I'll kill you. Now you also don't exist. <laughs> This drove him crazy. This is what drives real, this is the core of anti-Semitism. That the Jew at his core is It's not that I'll fight you. You don't really exist. The darkness that you profess doesn't exist. You know that drives people crazy, right? Lahavdal, not to compare, but in a marriage, what drives one, what, what drives, argue with me, don't argue with me. But the worst is, you just, I don't exist, right? That kills you, huh? You ignore Argue with me. Argue. At least let me trigger you. Could you at least get upset at me? It means I touch you. No, you don't exist. So that comes sometimes from emotional disassociation. <laughs> I can't deal with anything, so I disconnect and I run away. I just pick up my hand and there's nobody to work. work, work and, uh, but that's the worst breakdown. The worst breakdown is not arguments. They used to think that couples that argue have the worst marriages. Gutman showed, he's like the big researcher on marriage, he showed that 70% of good marriages, they argue as much as in bad marriages. <laughs> and that 70% of the arguments that they had after the Sheva Brothers, they had the first week, they have nine, when they're 90 years old. The, the, the different, what a good marriage is, not that there's less arguments. It's interesting. People think there's less argument. No, no, no. It's how you argue. If you're a Jewish husband and she's a Jewish wife, and I assume that's the case in this room, you're going to argue. <laughs> you're going to have different opinions. It's how you argue. There's arguing, but in the argument, you know that you're safe with me. I care about you even though I want to go somewhere else for Pesach. Okay. So what? So what? <laughs> or I don't want to go somewhere else. I want to stay home. You understand? The argument doesn't destroy marriage relationships. The whole Talmud Bavli is filled with arguments. It doesn't destroy anything. We, we're not afraid of arguments. But tell me in the argument that I'm safe. It's not personal. It's not bista shayta, bista tipish. I can't deal with you. You're such an That's not an argument. That's delegitimization. It's called contempt. Contempt that uh, marriage can't survive. 
So I'm just using it as a marshal. That means there's no relationship. Kaifa b'avoy means I don't have a relationship with avoy I don't, I, don't, I don't acknowledge its existence. When we do that in a marriage, it's called narcissism or it's called horrible, horrible trauma. And it, it's, us marriage will not survive it unless people just shut down and they live like robots. Because there has to be a connection. I have to be a metzius. <laughs> if I'm not a metzius and you make me feel like that, so then uh, it's too painful to be in this relationship. So I have to detach. Right? What anti-Semitism is really about is, the Gemara says this in two words, that a Yehudi is koifer b'avoyde zara. Koifer b'avoyde zara, the Rebbe Taichi denies that there's a metzius of avoyde zara. At least tell me that I exist and you hate me. You're tri- I'm not triggered by you. You don't exist. Ein oid malvade. The reason you exist is to be able to make a dira betachtoinam. The reason you exist is to be able to bring out the infinity of my soul. Ah, that's worse than anything. <laughs> you, you, hear, you hear the fart? It's, a, it's, it's very powerful. Kaifer b'avayda zara doesn't mean you don't worship b'avayda zara. B'avayda means you deny b'avayda zara. That drives me crazy. I don't exist. Yeah, you don't exist. Ain't no vada. Me, I'm up. I'll prove it to you. So they get more angry. I'll become more cruel. You still don't exist. That's what that's what Vekas means. Vekas doesn't mean there's no Haman. Vekas means that the whole Metzius of Haman, the Gemara says in Machal, on Haman minatayda minayin. So that everyone said it of Fabreng and it was half. He says, even Haman, Haman, the whole Metzius of Haman is Eich minatayda. <laughs> it's Eich minatayda. Haman is Eich minatayda. <laughs> Haman minatayda minayin. Haman is also minatayda. You think Haman has a Metzius? There's no Metzius. It's also minatayda. There's no Metzius outside of Teira. Teira is the blueprint of the universe. That drives Haman crazy more than anything. It's like Lich Bersha Samal Ka'imi Babayis in the holy way. You know, you come, you take me, you say, Ich bin Teira. <laughs> it's like, you're also the will of God. Please, Atkan, Atkan, turn me into your enemy. You're not worth it. You're not worth it to be your enemy. Whatever exists is not you. And the you that you think exists doesn't exist. So I'm, I'm not a, I don't acknowledge you. When you don't acknowledge Avedazara, that drives Avedazara crazy. So they'll do anything. They go crazy to prove, to, they want the Jews to say, I exist. I exist. You don't exist. <laughs> Itaka don't exist. What does it mean in your own life? It means that the darkness doesn't really exist. It exists as a catalyst for light. That's the pshat. So therefore, every year on Purim, we say that this Yom Tif will never ever leave the Jewish people. And we understand why it can't leave the Jewish people. Because what can leave is something that's subject to change. But the core, the ultimate truth, that part of you that's beyond the name, you could lose your name, you can't lose your essence. You could lose your name. You could change your name. People change their names constantly, right? They say, why did Yisrael have seven names? Because he had seven daughters. Every wedding, he went bankrupt. So he changed his name. After seven weddings, he had seven names. It's the old joke. You could change your name. You can't change your essence. So Purim could never be changed. Purim could never go through a change. This Nekuda of the Yehudi, you can't become Ois Yehudi. You can't cease to be a Yehudi. You could scream that you're not a Yehudi, but it won't help. You're a Yehudi. Because it's not based on your consciousness. It's not based on your ego and your understanding. If it's based on my understanding, I can get rid of it. I can change. And again, this is what Haman feels. That's what Hitler also felt. The Jew says, I'm a German Jew. I'm assimilated already. Who knows how many generations? We're intermarried since the early 1800s. Was willst du für mich? I'm a better German than you. I know German. The Yehudi you can't get rid of. In a positive sense, you can't get rid of it. So that's why you lo yavrim matayich ayudim shenim shachem ayoser 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 nailim from shachasim he bekelim, and the chiddush is that you can access it in vessels. What does it mean? You can access it in vessels. Vaynu. What does this mean practically? So shagam kashenim tzayim b'mayim adamatz of diim lo yisedi lo chayof abanoshim. A person sometimes finds himself in a situation where he says about himself, lo yisedi lo chayof abanoshim. I don't know my beauty. You don't see your beauty. You don't feel your beauty. Maybe you even feel your worthlessness. And there's so many things to remind you of it. And whatever that means in a person's life. Now 
the Simchas Purim of Adelayada takes me Loy Seidi and turns it into Adelayada, which is higher than the regular holidays, which are limited. The Loy Seidi, the ignorance, the confusion, the lack of knowledge, the darkness, turns the person into an Adelayada, which makes it higher than all the other holidays. It's from the nothingness that everything happens. And what's the Adelayada? Literally, Rav said, you should become intoxicated. I want to tell you, you don't know the difference between cursed is Haman and blessed is Mardukha. Now we'll understand what this means. Arur Haman represents everything in a person's life that you say, this is cursed. Baruch Mardukhai means it's blessed. There's a big difference. This is blessings, this is curses. Adelayada means you don't see the difference anymore. What does it mean you don't see the difference? There's darkness in my life and there's light in my life. This is Haman, this is Mardukhai. This is cursed, this is blessed. If I can ask you, if you could take three things of your life and delete them. Press control, all delete. Anybody would accept that? If God comes to you, take three things in your life. You don't have to tell me what they are. <laughs> Whatever you want. Control, all delete. Who will be deleting from our lives or from our brains? Three things. Think about what those three things are, right? Think. And then I'm put him, think again. And you'll realize that when you're in a state of Adelayada, then you don't want to delete anything. Why don't you want to delete anything? Because what we call Arur Haman and Baruch Mardechai, that's only from a place of Yada. From a place of Yada, this is my curse and this is my blessing. From a place of Adelayada, how do you know what's your curse and blessing? Maybe your curse is your blessing. It's not so simple. This is not to minimize pain. On the contrary, this comes from pain, through pain. It's not, oh, there's no pain, everything is beautiful. We don't, we don't say that. Arur Haman is Arur Haman. Baruch Mardukha is Baruch Mardukha. I feel like I'm on the Lebanese border. There's so many bombs coming today. <laughs> bombs of love. Bombs of love. Which is what we need at the Lebanese border. Yeah, put him, that's put him. It's, it's Adelayada, yeah. <laughs> that's what you're experiencing. This touches like the deepest truths of, of, of existence, beyond existence. So he says, when you go to a place that's Lamaila Mikola Kavin, it's beyond Kavin. Kavin means, Kav is a Kav, a, a comfort zone, a line, a structure. I go to a place beyond Kavin. I let go of Kavin. We all have our structures. What's life supposed to look like? That's your Kav. You know, you have this Kav. I have this Kav, right? You're an activist. This one is an intellectual. This one is a Gvir. I don't know. Whatever. Everyone has their Kav. This one is a, a giant here. It's your Kav. Can you let go of your Kav? You, we create a Kav. This is my line. My line of work. My line of experience. So a line of work, it's good to have. It's called having a job. Nishka Ferlich. But to have a line in life, that's a trap. A kav in work is good. A kav in life, be careful. Because your kids are going to take you out of that kav. So if you stay stuck in your kav, you're going to become a frustrated person. You have to touch a place that's beyond kavim. I'm not stuck in kavim. That's back to what we discussed. Oisik b'mitzvah, patem and a mitzvah. Every mitzvah includes all the other mitzvahs. And the mitzvahs are paradoxical. Because you're not stuck in a kav. In each mitzvah, I'm also doing all the opposite mitzvahs. Because I never get stuck in the manifestation of what I'm doing. I'm always touching the core of it. The kav is important as a keli, not as the essence. You understand? So when you touch lemailam and akavim, so now, how do you know what's arur and what's baruch? You don't know. A whole year you have to say arur haman and baruch mardachai. It's not a mitzvah to wake up in the morning and say, come on, let's get as many curses as we can. It's not the avoid of a person. You want toiv aniriv anigla. Of course. Put him as a nikudah that a person can touch, a truth. And it's a nikudah that exists a whole year. It's just put him, that's the, that's the Indian of put him, but it's a whole year. That in the place of Adalayada, I'm beyond kavim. What does it mean I'm beyond kavim? I don't know what's utter and what's baruch. I don't know. Maybe the deepest utter haman is the greatest baruch mardachai. And in a person's life, it means that those moments that shatter me completely, maybe those are the moments of rebirth. It's not maybe, that's what it is. In Hebrew, the word for a breakdown is mashber. Mashber. Right? Memshin bezre. From the word shvira. You know what it also means in Hebrew, right? Mashber. Huh? Birthstone. Birthstone. 
Isha Yosheves Ala Mashbeh. She sits on a birthstone. Who decided to give the same word? But that's the, it, it's, a, it's a very powerful idea. Every breakdown is a birthing experience. Yeah, it breaks down the system, no question. It broke down my system. But it's a birthing experience. A child comes out. I have to have seichel, right? The, the worst thing a woman can do, Yosheb uh, Damash will say, you know, this is too painful. Just <laughs> let's, let's, let's not break anything. In our life, that's what we do. Like, just get, get me out of the pain. Get me out of the pain. Just me, you know, give me an epidural forever. You know, put me to sleep forever. But if I could breathe through it and not run away from it, I feel a little embarrassed to give this metaphor, you know, as a man. But you get the point. I'm talking, uh, I'm not talking about things I know in terms of birth. I'm talking about the conceptually in each of our lives. If I can breathe, you breathe through it. Don't run away. Don't run away from the experience. The worst thing is to run away from the experience because you're running away from your child. This is your child. This is going to be the mafteach of Chai. It says Hashem didn't give over the keys of everything to everybody. There's a few keys He keeps for Himself. One of them is birth. Mafteach shel Chai, mafteach shel Ksham, mafteach shel Tchiyas HaMesa. He doesn't give it over to a shliach. In other words, this is a place that's beyond any shluchim. It's beyond names. You're birthing something new. And when the birth happens, this baby couldn't happen any other way. It's mashber. So that's what he, we're, we're saying. We, I, yada. I'm not in a place of yada. I don't have to figure it out. It's l'maylam and akavim. Mitzad ha-mesidis nefesh al-mokir ha-tayda v'mitzvah. Sh'lamaylam ha-eschalkus l'shloy shamudim sh'alayim o'ylam o'ymet. Because at that moment, the mesidis nefesh was to the source of tayda mitzvahs. And the source of tayda mitzvahs is beyond the division of the tri- tripod, the three pillars on which the world stands. Tayda v'ed mazhan. That's his chalkus. There's three. Put him, they touch the etzim, which is the source of Teir Mitzvahs. The source of Teir Mitzvahs is one. Achaz dibri elakim, shtayim zu shamati, it says in Telem. Shem spoke one, I heard two. When I hear things, right away there's duality. Achaz dibri elakim, in the, the Shoyrish it's all one. Adelayad ben Arham alabarach mardachai. The way I experience it, this is sur meira, this is asay toiv. This is negative, this is positive. This is cursed, this is blessed. And that's how it has to be. That's the way I experience it. And there's Torah, there's Vedas Bel Chasada. Because it's Shloy Shadvarim Ha'ayla Ma'amid. That's how the world stands. That's structure. Standing means structure. And then structure gets destroyed. It's Ada Loyada. So now there's only one. The Besidis Nefesh of Purim took him to the source of Torah and Mitzvahs. Umam Shechim Zeis. And one can access this. Ba'ayfin Shalayavrum and Techayyidim Zichim Layasaf Mizadam. That it should never leave the Jewish consciousness. Vahainu Shaydei Ha'avoyda Ata. This means the avoid now of loy seidiloch when we don't know this avoid don't think it's just an avoid for now the putim is going to be forever which means this avoid now brings out the greatest revelations of the gula the greatest revelations of the gula come out through putim bekelim lamata it brings the revelations of the gula in kelim in vessels down here bekelim in which vessels of mishta of feasting of simcha of joy and of yamta for festivities for a wonderful day afrei lechem shabbos afrei lechem purim ad the loyada in kelim oh I forgot about the gemara brachas No, it wasn't Rav, it was Mar. Mar bereded a vinik of a Messiah, and slice some are hochi a kind that sell a shiny made us for some of our memory. Mar bereded a vinna. I stand corrected. I don't know if anybody remembers that part of the sheer, but a kind that says, I just want to.